Welcome to another edition of Bison Break. My fault, not another edition. This is the special Hall of Fame edition of Bison Break, where we're, we're highlighting the Hall of Fame inductees that will be going in on September 30th. Uh, very, very excited to be there. I'm, I'm excited to get some content for you all. And one of those inductees is Daryl Dennis. Mrs. Dennis, thank you so much for making the time for us. My pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited. I always get excited because selfishly, I, I get a chance to learn a little bit more about the history of Howard Athletics that I, I normally wouldn't have, uh, even if, if being a graduate uh, in class of 09. So uh, I, I take special pride and being able to and being able to speak with you all that uh, have made such an indelible mark as to be uh, Hall of Famers. But before we get into all that, before we get into all that, this is Bison Break, so we got we got we got we got to learn a little bit more about you, even uh, even outside of your many athletic accomplishments. So here we go. First question: If I'm giving you a golf foursome, so you wanted a four. If I'm giving you a golf foursome, who are the other three people that you want in that golf foursome? That's a great question. I once played with the legendary Bill Russell, who oh, wow. uh, just uh, rest in peace. Uh, he was, he was, I used to manage the corporate celebrity golf tournament for, for the National Urban League at Doral. And Steve Wilson, my former teammate at Howard, and I would would uh, would play there, and Bill would be William Felton Russell, a native of my home state, but also Louisiana. Mm -hmm. He he would play, and he would he was very serious on the golf course, but he was a consummate uh, professional, good guy. And Steve uh, and Steve's father, touchdown Tommy Wilson. Would always would also play. His father was a all pro with the L.A. Rams and the Minnesota Vikings, and they came to the tournament every year, and it was fantastic. This was pre number forty five owning Doral, uh, but my constant enforcer would include. I would say Steve Wilson. I would say some of my my Kappa brothers that I play with often, uh, Greg Nobles. Uh, back nine, Bobby and Chris Williams, who's on the board of Augusta. Oh, so wow. maybe I've exp I've expanded it beyond. Go ahead, <laughs> beyond just <laughs> just a, a foursome. <laughs> it's a good time. It's hey that now that that sounds like a good time. And I mean, what I, I don't even know what that, I, I, that that caught me off guard. When we say Bill Russ. I mean that's uh, an iconic, uh, an iconic not only athlete but activist. Uh, was it was it a little intimidating playing the, playing alongside him? Well, the guy who could ensure that Bill was always, you know, I could say uh, very. Uh, Bill was always focused, but Dr. Fernal Briggs, his very good friend, is how we got Bill to the tournament, mm. and and he he was a dentist who trained under my father-in-law, Dr. Thomas Pinson who created the oral surgery department at Howard Dental, Dental School wow. and, and was a native of Vicksburg, Mississippi. Wow. So th that's the backdrop. That's, so that's, those, that's, guys, that's... those guys were serious golfers. Okay, I was about to ask, what kind of golfer was he? Well, Bill, Bill yeah. was serious. Steve uh -huh. Wilson, Steve, Steve was, he may, he may contend that he's still a, a scratch golfer, but Steve, Steve was a very good golfer. Wow. And, and uh, you know, my Kappa brothers, you know, we enjoy golf. Uh, they won't admit it, but I'm the better, the best <laughs> of, the, of the crew. Uh, based on my scorecard this past Sunday. <laughs> I'm going to cut that up and I'm going to send it to you because I know you're going to have fun sending it, sending it back to us. All right, got Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> All, right. All right, got you. Okay, so give me the movie that you, the movie that you've probably seen so many times you can almost quote it uh, scene for scene. Which movie? Question? What's the, what movie have you seen so many times? Like your one of your one of your favorite go to movies that you throw on and that you and that you just know back like the back of your hand. There are two. 
is the Godfather. It's also the People versus OJ. I've watched those. Yeah. The, the People versus OJ was on FX mm -hmm. with Courtney Vance. Mm -hmm. That was a that, that was a great one. But The Godfather is just a classic. And it 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 basically suggests that, well, the line that I love, keep your enemies. Your friends close and your, but your enemies close. What is the way? I'm 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 butchering friends, it up. Friends, friends close, close and your enemies closer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I. Uh, but you said movies, but there are some icons that I've met along the way that have been just really gigantic for me. Starting with my father. My father was the first one of the first All Americans for Coach Eddie Robinson at Grambling. And my brother, older brother, followed in my father's footsteps. They're the only father-son combination in the history of Grambling athletics to be recruited by Coach Robinson, captains for Coach Robinson, All-Americans for Coach Robinson, and in the Grambling Hall of Fame and Legends. Wow. Yes, Albert Dennis, the, the junior and the third. And then I have a younger brother who's an IP lawyer, who's the real brilliant one of the family. He's fluent in Mandarin, French. He's an IP lawyer, in-house counsel at Samsung, Georgetown undergrad, Tulane Law. You know, I'm just the one that had, I would say, people skills. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, 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 I looked at the resume, uh, and yes, I, I, I would agree. Uh, let's, so, so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, what, why, what made you originally choose to go to Howard? It was, it was, I had an opportunity to go to Grambling and Southern, among other schools at home, LSU, out west, Stanford. And when I appeared to be leaning towards going to Southern because my rival was the number one recruit at Grambling and rightfully so, Carlos Pennywell, who ended up being a third round pick with the New England Patriots our senior year, our respective senior years in college. My mom realized that I was about to commit to go to Southern and she made it clear that I was not coming home to eat in her kitchen, her dining room, if I played for the rival Jaguars. And she said, you know, your father may be real cool about this, but you're not going to Southern and coming to this house. And so it was a non-starter. And at that point, uh, a commitment or a statement I made to my dad my junior year in, in high school, when I sat at home with a good friend that I grew up with, Roderick Fape, who, by the way, led the nation in receiving our senior year in college. He was at Louisiana Tech. He broke all the records in Louisiana Tech history. He broke Roger Carr, Pat Tilly's records, who all started in the league. But he got blackballed at Tech because he, he spoke out for the inclusion of black cheerleaders in 1977. Wow. That, that's his legacy. But for that, he would have been a guy drafted in the league. He played in the World League, but we sat with my father, to get back to the statement, we sat with my father my junior year, at the end of our junior years in high school, and my dad asked, he said, so where are you guys interested in going to college? And it must have been a divine thought that entered our brains at the time. We both uttered out Howard University. And fast forward to tape, Coach Porter becomes the head coach at Howard. I hadn't committed. And he called me back and says, look, you told us that you wanted to go to a school with a law school. And you know Howard has such a fine reputation. Can we can we bring you on board to help us 
grow the program to the prominence that we would like to take it to. And I said, Coach, I couldn't think of a better opportunity to uh, begin my college career. And that's how I came to Howard. And we brought in some other great recruits in the class of 74, the incoming class, freshman class of 74. We, we believe that we had the best recruits that Howard has ever had, including inductees Herman Redden, Brakefield. Brakefield and I, who's in the incoming Hall of Fame class, we were in school together in Shreveport, Louisiana since the fourth grade. Wow. He was the first thousand yard rusher in Howard history. And Herman, Herman was a true shutdown corner and a man who would really, you know, annihilate anybody attempting to gain one, one iota of a yard across the line of scrimmage. And that's why San Francisco made him the first draft pick out of, out of Howard University. Wow, that is that's amazing. That does sound like a, a, a stacked squad. I want to talk a little bit about what it was like to try to balance. You, you mentioned the importance of academics. What was it like trying to balance uh, football and going to school? It was difficult because no one talks about it these days, at, you know, but the NCAA wasn't as stringent on, on, on uh, practice, academic balance as they are today. Uh, we, we lost a lot of athletes in our freshman year because the academic rigor at Howard is unlike any school in my mind, other than potentially the Ivies in the United States. And so we had uh, students, student athletes, if you like that moniker, who were in, in disciplines such as chemistry, pre-made engineering. And it would have been better to have brought them into school in the, in the summer to get some of the prerequisite courses out of their, out of the, you know, to have matriculated through those courses so that when the football season started, they didn't have those demands on that time because a lot of the STEM courses require lab time. Lab time is usually during practice time between three and six o'clock or beyond. And, and I really hope in the future, our administration can think forward about how we bring in STEM athletes or, or athletes who are interested in STEM disciplines but have the academic, uh, athletic talent to be on the playing field. And the better way to approach that is to allow them to come in in early spring when they graduate from high school and get six to 12 credits in the summer as they do at other major universities. And, and when they uh, enter their fall semester, they have a lighter academic load that's more manageable. It's about course management, because at the end of the day, we were trying to see, achieve a win-win. Right. I, th I think that's a, that's a phenomenal idea. Um, I want to ask a little bit in terms of you accomplished a lot during your, during your playing career. If there was one highlight that you kind of look back on the most fondly over your, over your, your playing time at Howard, what, what kind of, what do you think about most frequently? Well, there are three games that stand out for me. Uh, my sophomore year, when we, well, I'll go back. My freshman year, pregame speech at Coach Douglas Porter, who will be 94, 95 in a couple of weeks in Louisiana. And I'll visit him when I visit my 90-year-old mother and my 101-year-old uncle. Nice. But, but. Pre-game speech Doug Porter gave us was in, in December of, nine, of 74. Howard was about to play Florida a 
in the in the Orange Blossom Classic in Miami, Florida. Howard University made history earlier that day on the soccer field. We be, we became the first. Well, it was actually our second time winning the NCAA Division One soccer championship with then Coach Lincoln Phillips. Mm -hmm. And by the way, those student athletes on that team had some of the highest academic averages, not just in athletics, but on campus, in Bain and all those guys. You know, they've become engineers, doctors, and the like. But he he challenged us to replicate their successes. Uh, moving into my sophomore year, we played in the OIC Classic of Dr. Leon Sullivan in Philadelphia in the field that the Philadelphia Eagles once played. And we had a rematch with the Florida a and Rattlers, who were not at that time in our conference. We beat them 6 nothing, and yours truly caught the 49-yard touchdown to defeat the Rattlers in Philadelphia. Uh, and my quarterback, Mike Banks, would acknowledge we I would have had a second touchdown in the first half, but for a bad throw. Now, <laughs> yeah. The other highlight, I would say, was when we – Again, played Southern University my senior year in uh, RFK Stadium, and we beat them. And again, I had bragging rights when I went home because not only did we beat them, but I I had a, a wonderful 65-yard uh, post route where Roy Jefferson and, and Charlie Taylor used to catch their touchdowns in an RFK stadium, and we beat the Southern University Jaguars, who was coached at that time by a neighbor of my family. Uh, and he, I play golf with him even now when I go home, uh, Gerald Kimball. He's a good Kappa man. Okay. So I remind him of that. So those are, those are some of my athletic highlights. And the last one, I'm probably the only wide receiver or, or should, should we say skill player, who's also been a special teamer as a field goal extra point kicker. Oh, wow. Yes, and in this game, we were playing North Carolina Central. And the night before, a young lady uh, visited my room and I didn't make curfew because my wide receiver coach came by to uh, make sure we make her feel. Only time he's done it, he did, the only time he did it, rather, in my four years of Howard. <laughs> and so I'm almost wondering whether it was a conspiracy <laughs> because I had never had an unannounced guest to come by the night before a game, right. for, you know, when I knew I had bed checked. And uh, my coach came by and naturally when a young lady had just come in with 15 minutes earlier, uh, no, no uh, untoward behavior was in process, but what, what guest in Drew Hall, I didn't feel comfortable opening the door with my coach berating me with, with guests. So as a result, the next morning when I when I arrived at the team pregame menu a uh, meal, uh, Richard Stebbins, who by the way ran in the '64 Olympics with Bob Hayes. Oh wow! He handed yes, he was our wide receiver coach. He handed a baton to Bob Hayes to win the gold medal in the '64 Olympics when he was only 19 years old. Wow! And he he. Uh, admonished me that I would not be playing that day as a receiver. But as we got close to the end of that game, Coach Porter came to me and he and he said, I need you to be ready when we score the touchdown to kick the winning extra point. He didn't ask Coach Stevens, <laughs> can he go in the game? He's the head coach. 
he made the decision. And it was in the hilltop, this finally kick that I, with a, with a, with a, basically a frozen right ankle. Uh, but the ball made it over and we won the game. But had any lineman reached their hand above, <laughs> above the line of scrimmage, they could have easily batted the ball down. It was, it was that awful. <laughs> had you ever kicked before? Oh yeah, I, I I often kick field goals and extra points. Wow! When I was a Bison wide receiver, <laughs> that is that's a that is a highlight. <laughs> that is yeah. certainly a highlight. I want yeah. to talk a little bit about about the reason going to Hall of Fame, um, about the Buffalo Soldier Award, and yeah. about and 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 essentially that is though that's uh, named after the the Buffalo Soldier, but it's it's about the contributions you made to Howard Athletics after your career was done. I just want to talk a little bit about the importance uh, of giving back after after your playing career was done. What was the what was the genesis of it, and and and, and what made you um, what made you continue to do it long after you had uh, you had finished? My life has been enriched by matriculating through Howard University. I could not be enjoying the riches and the experiences that I have, have been a, benef a benefactor of, but for Howard University. And I'm, I'm so happy to call Howard home. And throughout all the coaches we've had athletic, I mean, in the athletic department, be it football, track, basketball, you name it, swimming, my love for Howard University is about three areas of the university. The athletic department, school of business, school of law. Those are the areas that, that really have made me the person I am today. But for the experiences that I was able to um, benefit from because of various departments at Howard. I can't think of how my life would have uh, reached the point of success that I've achieved. And so I really believe it's my, it's incumbent upon me to give back. You know, in my company, we recruit students from Howard, other HBCUs and all other universities throughout the country on, to perform on some of the contracts that we've been awarded by federal, the public and private sectors. And so when I think of Howard University, I think of an institution that's committed to excellence. And I'd like to always do my part to increase more opportunities for students who are matriculated through our fine alma mater. You talked about your, 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 your post-playing career in terms of your, your business and your opportunities. Could you talk to me a little bit more about exactly what, uh, what that is as, as wired to net? Could you talk to me a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, upon retiring from Verizon Communications in 2005, you know, during the Verizon years, I directed a small business program I was in the legal contracts administration group there where we we review, we we team with small businesses on federal contracts. And we provided a, an array of diverse companies opportunities to perform on these contracts. And a lot of people may or may not be aware that when a large business is awarded a contract, there's a, by the federal government, <clears throat> there's a requirement to subcontract a certain percentage of their businesses, uh, of their contracts rather, subcontracts to small businesses of a different variety, women, veteran owned, SDB, small disadvantaged businesses, which includes 8A firms that are regulated by the SBA. And 
and and and in doing that time frame, it was my goal and my responsibility to ensure that not only did we meet our subcontracting plan, but why not exceed it? And so that was my role at Verizon Federal Communications to ensure that we brought in firms of those caliber to the table so that they would have an opportunity to be under the umbrella of Verizon. And Verizon at that time, <coughs> excuse me, was a member of the billion dollar round table, which meant that Verizon among a select cadre of, of multi of Fortune 50 companies awarded over a billion dollars in business to minority businesses and women and others in that small business space. And I was proud that I had a role in that. Uh, afterwards, I was, or in the interim of my Verizon career, which started in 91, we were then Bell Atlantic. I was uh, selected by the Clinton administration to serve at SBA as counselor to the administrator as well as uh, Associate Deputy Administrator for Entrepreneurial Development. The, the Small Business Development Center, that's at Howard University, mm -hmm. was one of 58 lead SBDCs, as they are called, that were my responsibility or my departments, my team's department's responsibility to manage. It was $200 million that we managed that the SBDCs received. And only two, by the way, were historical black colleges and universities of the 58 lead centers, only two were, were HBCUs, Howard and the University of the Virgin Islands. There are 1,100 plus sub-centers, but those centers are designed to all of them to provide counseling, and services to SBDC, I mean, to small firms throughout the country. I was the person who had accountability for ensuring that those firms met their, the metrics that we negotiated with their association to help, among others, minority business. Because at the end of the day, the economic engine that propels this country is small business. And, and we, you know, I coined the phrase, entrepreneurs are not born, you know, they must be developed. And that's, that's, that's my mantra. I believe in that. If I were to give you 30 seconds to to talk to our 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 alumni base about the importance of giving back why they should give back what would you say to them well tell them that view it as a component of your development if you don't give back you cut off the lifeline and if you cut off the lifeline one day when and if the federal largesse which we are heavily dependent upon if it evaporates or dissipates, Howard could be eliminated. And we don't want that on our legacy. It can't be, it can't be a start point or an end point. It, it has to be something that we, it's, it's gotta be cultivated and ingrained in our culture that we give back. If it's a dollar, if it's a million dollars, we have to give back. And that's why I give religiously to athletics, to the law school, and, and I do creative things. In a suite that I have at the, at the Verizon Monumental Sports Center, I hold fundraisers when there's a concert because I think that's a creative way to reach our people. Uh, you know, if they come to a concert, when there's an Adele, when there's a, a Bruno Mars, they might be more inclined to, to give knowing that they're gonna have an enjoyment but at the same time, funds will go to the Dean, Dean Holly Walker will tell you I've done it for the law school. Uh, when Dean Harvey was still the Dean, 
uh, at the business school. I, I, we we did it with, with 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 him, and we'll continue to do it when the coaches have needed funds for things at football program, uh, swim program. I'll step up because, but for Howard University, I wouldn't I wouldn't enjoy the things that I've enjoyed in my life. I really I wouldn't have met Dr. Francis Wellson, Dr. Francis Chris Wellson, who's a state I have bought properties from on a run along the bay, and I'm on the contract to buy in the Gold Coast. If I hadn't come to Howard, I would have read about her, but I wouldn't have had that kinship with her. So that's that's my story, and I'm sticking with it, as they say. I I I as always, he Daryl Dennis <clears throat> said it. I, I think the best um, BisonExpress.org/slash/give. The the more you all give, the more we all get. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. I look. I'm looking forward to to meet you for the for the Hall of Fame and induction ceremony because I I've I've been very very fortunate to be able to sit and speak and listen and learn so much from so many of you guys already. Uh, and as I mentioned. Uh, guys, we will have content for you uh, from that night. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you. Likewise. Thank you. And and bring your A game when we play golf. I'm going to bring A game. You're right. I'm going to bring A game. Now, whether or not it's the A game, well, <laughs> put, put less pressure on me than that. <laughs> Take it easy, man. Hey, thanks for your flexibility on making this happen. Absolutely. No problem.